Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining CNBC. We're excited to have you. I want to kick off by asking you um, to address for us what's happening uh, at the moment with Libya. We understand that there was just a meeting of the Arab League. How concerned are you that Turkey is taking unilateral action here? Uh, well, Libya, I think, uh, is uh, at the forefront of uh, regional issues right now. There's a lot of interest uh, in Libya, uh, and uh, that interest, uh, you know, expands really several regions. It's uh, Arab interest, African interest, uh, European interest, and so on and so forth. I think we're very concerned. We're very concerned because today, I think the priority uh, is to try and save lives. And uh, as uh, Turkish and militia forces and Syrian mercenaries uh, are about to uh, attack the city of Sirt, 60,000 uh, civilians are trapped in that city. And uh, I think what we have seen in Libya over uh, the last nine years, really a pendulum between the West uh, the part forces of Libya controlling uh, the majority of Libya and then the pendulum swinging towards the eastern part uh, forces of Libya. I think the conclusion in all this is that we do need to move very quickly to uh, a comprehensive uh, uh, a comprehensive ceasefire and to uh, re-engage politically because clearly we're very convinced that in Libya, there is no military solution. Now, the Arab League, I think, uh, has come out with a very strong uh, uh, resolution uh, condemning the presence of foreign forces in Libya, asking for a ceasefire, and asking for the ejection of mercenaries out of uh, Libya, and uh, for a return to the political process. Uh, where we are currently is engaging Turkey, uh, which uh, is ag aggressively actually uh, moving on in several Arab countries, uh, Syria, Iraq, Libya, uh, Somalia, various other uh, Arab countries. So we have Turkey trying to uh, lay clean here to uh, a geopolitical position in Libya. and. Uh, uh, you know, the Egyptians, on the other hand, are very concerned about developments. And President Sisi, in a landmark uh, speech in Sidi Barani a couple of days ago, uh, has basically identified uh, what he had called red lines, and this is uh, Sirt and Al Jabra. So we are really at the cusp of a regional confrontation, uh, which we need. Uh, to avoid at all costs, uh, we need uh, also to uh, ensure that uh, the you know diplomatic uh, efforts, whether these are European, whether these are Arab, whether they are from the United States and others, uh, African, should really uh, be successful in uh, in in first of all averting this confrontation over CERT, and then leading to uh, a ceasefire, and then to a longer term and sustainable political solution in Libya. Your Excellency, this area surrounding CERT controls essentially 80% of Libya's total oil wealth. How much do you believe is a motivation when we come to Turkey fueled by their ambitions uh, to have control over that oil? Well, I, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's all always uh, speculative, but I think uh, the Turks are uh, basically uh, trying to achieve several things. They are trying to establish a foothold in uh, a wealthy Arab country such as Libya, and we've seen that in 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 other uh, Arab areas. And this is, you know, sort of uh, a geostrategic positioning of Turkey as a regional uh, power. But the problem is that this- They've tried just, that one before, haven't they? Yes, and I think this is continued. And I, I would argue uh, that this is uh, actually uh, 
not the right approach for Turkey to establish a fruitful and, uh, and, and, and friendly relationships with the Arab world. As we all know, the Arab regional order is going through a very difficult period. And I think countries such as uh, Turkey and Iran should respect, and Israel uh, also, should respect also the vulnerabilities they see in, the in their, what is essentially their neighborhood and should not try and exploit it. And what we are really seeing is an exploitation really of, of this. I think other than that, the Turks also uh, uh, somehow with uh, the AKP, uh, somehow they are not comfortable in uh, the size of their nation state. And they hark back to their, you know, sort of uh, imperialist uh, ambitions of past Ottoman uh, um, uh, empire and so on and so forth. But realistically, uh, I would argue that uh, time will tell that this is not how you really build a solid and fruitful relationship for a country that is as important and as dynamic really for the region. And I think from that perspective, uh, I would say that this is uh, 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 an overextended policy that will actually hurt Turkey if it continues. Your Excellency, the UAE controls over a trillion dollars across its sovereign wealth funds. You have 6% of the world's proven oil reserves. And my daddy always used to say that whoever has the gold makes the rules. How do you respond to those who would suggest that the UAE's foreign policy has an agenda? Well, uh, again, I mean, uh, agenda is, uh, is correct, but not in a, in a devious way. I think, first of all, we should, you know, when you mentioned these numbers, I think we're very cognizant that we should not uh, suffer from any sort of hubris here. I think this is something essential. So the, o the OE's foreign policy, I think, uh, clearly recognizes that this is a different international system. And a different international system will require the UAE and other regional players to take more responsibility for this prosperity and stability of their region. But the other also component of the UAE's foreign policy is to understand that this cannot be done alone. You have to work in tandem with friends and allies. So clearly when we are concerned about the stability and prosperity of the Arab world, we don't work alone. We, are, we don't have the size, we don't have the uh, political gravitas to work alone. So the important part here is to work with allies. Within an Arab context, we see, for example, working with Egypt, working with Saudi Arabia, with other countries, such as uh, Jordan and Morocco and Algeria and others, very essential. We see this very essential. So from that... It's tough though, isn't it, Your Excellency, it is, when it oil is. is at 40, because Saudi Arabia doesn't necessarily have uh, the willingness or the ability uh, to project its foreign policy in the ways that it has in the past. Well, Does that mean that the UAE is taking more on its shoulders? No, no. The UAE will never work alone in any theater. We've worked with NATO and with the United States and Afghanistan. We've worked also with the international community in stabilization in, Bal in the Balkans. We worked with NATO in, uh, in the effort to save the Libyan people uh, after uh, Colonel Gaddafi's surge on Benghazi. We've worked with Saudi Arabia and Yemen, and we're working with other countries, such as Egypt and France and others in Libya. Uh, all this really comes from uh, an understanding that in this new international system and evolving international system, there is more burden sharing and you need to be part of those countries that share the burden. But you also have to work with old allies and important allies such as the United States and with regional uh, players and also send the right messages to countries such as Iran and Turkey and Israel that uh, you know you are in the region uh, and uh, it is in your interest not to trespass on Arab sovereignty and Arab stability and that will actually make it better for you and for everybody else involved. 
I want to ask you about the U.S. specifically because, granted, we're just a few months away from November 4th, but at the moment, uh, Joe Biden is leading President Trump in the polls. This is a, a former vice president who was very much for the JCPOA and conversations with Iran with regards to their nuclear program. If there's a move to resuscitate that agreement in the event of a Biden presidency, where does the UAE stand? I think, I think first of all, the relationship with uh, the United States is a cornerstone of our foreign policy. We have seen a uh, Republican governor, a government come, uh, democratic governments come, and we deal with the United States as an ally and as a friend and understand also its institutions and understand also that uh, the United States has its national interest and has its friends. So I would say that we always look at America's engagement uh, in, uh, in the region as something that is positive. It doesn't mean that we don't have uh, disagreements in how we see things. And uh, for, in, in our opinion, this is a very speculative, I would say, uh, question. But we do have our very strong feelings that the JCPOA did not work. And we feel that the region not being part of the process that led to the JCPOA is partly responsible for the JCPOA uh, being interpreted by Iran as a carte blanche for Iran to expand its influence. I hope that Iran has learned from this experience. I think that any uh, review of the Iran uh, policy uh, is something that we will need to deal with at the time. I don't really want to speculate on how American elections will develop. That's an internal American issue. But what I would say that the sum total of our relationship with the United States far outweighs how we look at certain issues differently. And I think that these are things that we can adjust to, uh, we can argue and uh, you know, put across our points and we think that we have quite convincing arguments in various uh, areas. We seek good relations with all regional players, whether these are uh, Iran, whether it is uh, Turkey, whether it is Israel, but we do have our very, very strong views when it comes to uh, these countries thinking of, uh, of Arab sovereignty as their, what I would say, geostrategic space and, and you know, give themselves the sort of rights to act with impunity in what uh, is essentially uh, the stability of the Arab world. Your Excellency, this time last year, um, I was along the coastline in Fujairah reporting on tanker attacks. Um, we were seeing a lot of malign activity coming from the Iranian regime, and certainly we were just a few weeks really away from their attack on Aramco's oil facilities. How would you describe the relationship between the UAE and Iran now? Well, again, as, as you know, I mean... Uh, are you in talks? No, we're not, we're not in talks. I mean, there are functional things that take place, and these are, you know, Coast Guard meeting, etc., but none none really since COVID-19. Uh, I think that uh, Iran has also been, uh, you know, sort of enmeshed in its own uh, COVID uh, uh, issue and so on and so forth. I think what is necessary here is to do several things. Number one is to try, as we move forward, to avoid escalation. I have my issues with Iran, I have my problems with Iran, but at the same time, I think I have an interest in not, uh, in not escalating within uh, the Gulf. The Gulf is uh, not a very big uh, you know, uh, area of water, and as a result, it is my interest to de-escalate, and I hope also with post-COVID issues, uh, post -COVID COVID priorities coming, I hope that the de-escalation becomes more than all. Having said that, Iran has to recognize that we do have serious issues. We do have serious issues of an Iran that is expanding and, as you hear, controlling four 
uh, Arab capitals. And now towards Iran, some would say Turkey is trying to control three Arab capitals. And I don't know who is trying to control another Arab capital. So clearly, we do have an interest. We do have an interest, but we also need to be quite, uh, quite forward by saying that Iran's policy in the region, its regional policy, its proxies, its uh, missile uh, development policies has been really problematic. And this is something that we need to deal with and we need to deal with effectively. And it is in our interest for, uh, in the longer term, I don't really see it right now, but it is in our interest to think of a region uh, that is uh, more about everybody's stability and more about everybody's sovereignty and more about everybody's uh, prosperity. We're not there yet, but I think the message of, uh, of uh, you know, disagreements uh, being dealt with, and this is why, you know, we are very much, uh, you know, supportive of Iran engaging in various calls by the United States for negotiations, because we do really need to sort this out. And, you know, for us, we can't sit there and say we're not worried about Iran's regional policy, and we are not worried about Iran's uh, ballistic missile program. We are very worried because we've seen these regional policies responsible for a lot of instability in the region. And we've seen these missiles being uh, used in various nefarious activities in our region. We have to be frank with that. But at the same time, we share the same region and we would like to resolve these issues uh, politically. And we would like to resolve these issues where, uh, as I said, we have a shared prosperity and shared stability. When you think about this with regards to the broader region, one country that is um, very much in the crosshairs economically is, of course, Lebanon. Uh, Iran has a great interest there via Hezbollah. How dangerous do you feel the situation in Lebanon really is today? Well, I think, I think very worrying, to be honest. Uh, you know, we've seen, uh, we've seen an accumulation of uh, problems in Lebanon and we've seen also uh, a dictation, really, of the political discourse by Hezbollah, which really has an army within the state. But on the other hand, also the current economic meltdown is very worrying. And, uh, you know, the inability, really, of uh, Lebanon to deal with uh, this economic meltdown uh, is also worrying. I think uh, what has not helped Lebanon also that's not the whole picture, is that Lebanon over the last 10 years has not really been able to successfully uh, maintain its bridges with the Arab world and with the Gulf. And we've sent over the years many messages to uh, Lebanese uh, politicians, including the current administration in Lebanon. You've sent also a lot of economic support. Over the years, of course, but we've sent also messages that you know do not really polarize Lebanon within uh, within Arab uh, to Arab confrontations. You need to sort of uh, uh, sort of secure yourself because the time will come when you will need these bridges. And if you burn these bridges, it'll be very difficult for you to uh, to, to 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 use really the the huge reservoir of. Uh, goodwill and the huge reservoir of financial support that Lebanon needs. In terms of that financial support, do you believe that the UAE will send funds to Lebanon to help bail them out? Well, again, I mean, the UAE's position has uh, been very clear on this, and we have, uh, we have been... Uh, I mean, if that's the only way to avoid no. a potential tinderbox kind of conflict. Again, as I said, we've been very clear, and our position is, as I said before, we don't act alone. We are always part of a coalition and a group of friends and partners, and we will work and be a full partner in this. So clearly, if we see some of our friends, our major powers that are interested in Lebanon working 
in a plan, we will consider that. But up to now, as I said, what we're really seeing here is a de deterioration of Lebanon's Arab relations and Gulf relations over the last 10 years. And Lebanon is partly, partly paying the price of that right now. We're just days away from the July 1 deadline uh, that the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had set uh, for the annexation of 132 West Bank settlements, as well as the Jordan Valley. Do you believe if they go ahead with that plan, it would be a crime? Well, again, it'll be a disaster. It'll be a disaster because the whole world, uh, you know, we are bound by the uh, Arab peace plan. We are part of 21, 22 Arab countries that are bound by that plan. So we have done everything we can over the last uh, two weeks, three weeks, and engaged ferociously, diplomatically, to make it clear that a country that is moderate, such as the UAE, is very, very concerned. It is very concerned because the whole consensus, really, of a two-state solution, the whole consensus of a negotiated settlement will be broken down by these unilateral action. And, uh, you know, again, we've sent all the right messages. I mean, it was unprecedented, really, for our, our ambassador to the United States to write... To attend the meeting and, at the and, White House initially for the Kushner plan. And then plan. to write to, uh, to uh, in the Israeli press to send that very, very clear message uh, I've also had my own uh, interviews also, and all our purpose was to do what we can. I mean, again, at the end of the day, what decides really the trajectory of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian issues, is the Israelis and Palestinians, and the countries that are bordering Israel and countries like the United States. But the UAE really has been very vocal in warning against this step. And I say it again here. This will be a total disaster, and we're urging really the Israeli government and urging the Israeli public to, cons to reconsider and to look beyond the sort of immediate gratification that the certain groups, their ideology brings, and think really long term, think long term whether they really do want uh, a more uh, stable and uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue, uh, or do they really want to come down the road and look at a single state really with equal rights, which is, in my opinion, something that will be really the dominant debate if we move along this line. Is the Israeli-Palestinian issue the last hurdle really um, to, frankly, not just a dialogue, but a normalization of relations with the Arabian Gulf, with the UAE, with Saudi Arabia, if they get past that hurdle, if they solve that issue, could we see an opening up of relations? You know, I mean, again here, the Israeli-Palestinian issue is a major, major fault line in the region. But as we have seen also over the last decade or so, there are other major issues. So to try and discount the issue, I think is wrong but to try also to put the issue as the only uh, issue of, of real interest in the region is also wrong. I think the UAE, uh, like many other countries, I mean, Israel today has uh, active relations with Egypt, and Jordan, and uh, Turkey, and Qatar, and many, many other countries. And I think the UAE recognizes that. And I think the UAE is also coming and moving forward and saying, and I've, I've said this before, that lines of communication are vital because we can do more with open line of communications than the total rejection that we have seen over the last uh, 30, 40 uh, years. Uh, and from that perspective, I think it is essential. And I think also when you really look at the UAE's message uh, against uh, the annexation of Palestinian lands and adding these annexed lands to the Israeli occupation, uh, you, 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 it is important and essential to see that the Israelis are really taking notice in their press, in their public opinion, and in their uh, elite policy circles. 
And I think this is the sort of thing that you can bring here, and it is important that we can bring here. And finally, sir, I want to ask you specifically about China. China today is um, the second, second biggest source of foreign direct investment um, in the UAE, and they are your biggest trading partner. Um, when I asked this question of uh, His Excellency Yusuf Ataba, the ambassador to Washington, he essentially said that there were raised eyebrows in the corridors of power there about the growing relationship between the UAE and China. Is it possible, do you think, that the UAE could act as a bridge of sorts, given the, frankly, hostile conversations we're seeing between Beijing and Washington today? Well, again, I mean, I would say that the UAE's concern uh, over this hostile uh, confrontation is a global concern. We're not alone here. Everybody, or almost everybody, uh, has a huge financial and investment really, and trade relations with China, investment and trade relations with China. We're not alone here, and we're not unique here. And at the same time, like many, many countries in the world, we all recognize that America has the largest, really, uh, network of allies in the world, and we consider ourselves an important ally for the United States. So clearly, we see this confrontation. It worries us. We would like to see a more, I would say, a cooperative relationship between Washington uh, and, and, and Beijing. Uh, I have to say that our reading is it doesn't look so, uh, but we will have to balance and manage. And it is very difficult. I would say right now, perhaps, uh, we are managing like many, many other countries, but more and more, I think we look at that and see that this will be a major, major issue. Every time we see confrontation between Washington and Beijing, the markets actually tremble and the markets are affected. And uh, clearly, uh, I would say that uh, competition between these two giants uh, will continue and sometimes you would come and say also to a certain extent it's it'll be natural but i think we have an interest that this competition uh, is more nuanced and that this competition uh, is at the same time uh, does not really shake what is already a very weak international system so i would uh, you know i would not exaggerate and say that this is a balancing act act that the U not only the UAE, but I would say the ma majority of countries in the world will have to deal with. And, and we're hoping that uh, there is a certain stability in this very important uh, relationship between Washington and Beijing. When you think about the challenges facing um, the world post COVID-19, even as we continue to see resurgences of this virus uh, around the world, and governments grappling, frankly, to tackle them. What do you see as the single greatest challenge here? Is it uh, this standoff between Washington and Beijing? Is it the abilities of governments to tackle the economic fallout from what we're seeing playing out right now uh, across the world? Or is it closer to home? Well, again, as you know, I mean, you've, you've, you, you've you know, sort of categorized them. I think, <clears throat> I think the return to normalcy whatever that means, will be a challenge. And the return to normalcy is not only economic. It's about kids going back to school. It's about uh, people taking the fear of uh, pandemics. And for us, as an international system, to be better uh, equipped to deal with any sort of public health uh, issues, such as the one that we have faced. But I think in the region here, uh, also, uh, it, it is important that conflictual politics, as usual, doesn't return. I mean, again, I don't really see COVID-19 as, uh, uh, you know, a magical wand that will change the region and will change relationships between the, the region. But what I am really hoping for is that it will actually bring ascendancy to uh, Issue to, to issues such as de-escalation, ascendancy to resolving conflict uh, politically rather than through military means, increasing, for example, regional cooperation. If we can achieve some of these 
uh, what I would say, uh, stretch targets, targets that uh, will actually improve conditions, I'll be very happy with. Your Excellency, do you still consider Saudi Arabia to be one of your closest allies, given uh, the recent events with the moves in the oil market? That caught a lot of folks off guard, I know. Saudi Arabia, uh, our uh, prosperity and security is tied to Saudi Arabia's stability, prosperity, and security. And I don't see any way that the UAE prosperity and security can be uh, cut off from Saudi Arabia's uh, you know, stability, security, etc. Uh, I always repeat the story of uh, a, a very important Saudi delegation coming here uh, to see Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, and I was attending, and it was the late Prince Saud al-Faisal who headed that, with a strategic message uh, from uh, King Abdullah, uh, God bless his soul, and uh, Prince Saud started with uh, complimentary comments about the UAE, its development, etc. And what uh, Sheikh Mohammed said in that uh, important meeting, uh, in the beginning of the meeting, uh, st still rings true. And he said, uh, Prince Saud, thank you very much, but we wouldn't have been able to achieve what we have been able to achieve if Saudi Arabia was unstable. So clearly for us, Saudi Arabia is one of our most important relationships, one of our most important allies. And essentially for Saudi Arabia to be, whether it's good times, whether it's bad times, our stability and our prosperity is tied hand in gloves with Saudi Arabia. So the economics of it doesn't concern you? The economics of it are important. We can discuss it. But, you know, the sort of history and geostrategic and geography and, uh, and, 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 and political system and so on and so forth, I just don't see how uh, the region, the Gulf region, can be stable and prosperous if Saudi Arabia is not. Your Excellency, we have to wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining CNBC. Thank you.